guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Yvonne from Ginger Chick Rehab. On my channel, along with my husband Chris, we do thrift flips. We take unwanted, unloved, outdated items and give them new life. From a salt and pepper shaker to a large hutch, there isn't any thrifted item that we don't have a vision for. And we get them to ready to resell. We sell here locally. We have a couple retail booths and a local antique mall. But we love to share the process with you all and share our vision with you and what we do to these items in case this is something that you're interested in getting into or something that you already do or just something that you would like to do some of the items that are laying around your own home. In today's video, I am bringing you one of my thrift haul makeovers. So I am going to be sharing the process of what I do with these thrifted finds and that I get them ready to resell. As you begin to watch this video, what do you see when you look at these items? What is it that you see? Do you see unloved, unwanted, outdated, trash of items so in this video i am going to share with you my vision what i see for these thrifted found items what i think that they can become so it's time to get my hands on all these items i have picked them up from the thrift store and i'm ready to assess what i my vision for them is but the first thing i need to do is i need to remove any of the price tags and any store stickers so these are now my items. These are now in the Ginger Chick Rehan hands and I want to make them mine. So I definitely want to remove anything of what they used to be. And then if anything is screwed together or any glass, anything that I can remove, I will separate it. I just am a fan of painting things separately to get those crisp lines. So any little screws, any little hinges, any little light bulbs, anything that I can take apart, I will. For this little box in this grouping, I only have one thing that needs to be sanded down. This was hand painted on and so it is raised. So the way that I like to paint and I like to distress, if I do not sand that smooth, when I go to sand it, all that detailing will show through and that is not what my vision is. And now you know they were thrifted items so you don't know where they've been. So now they all need a good, good cleaning so all i'm doing is using some super clean in a hot soapy bucket of water and just cleaning every single piece down you want to make sure that you don't have any residue anything that pre prevent all that time that you spend painting from preventing them from it the paint from sticking so for this clock face though i love this clock the front of this clock is plastic it is not glass and i don't really want to have to try to scrape it with an exacto knife or a scraper as little as possible so i'm just putting a piece of contact paper this is just the clear duck brand contact paper i use it as transfer tape anyway so i always have it on hand so i'm just covering the entire piece of face of this clock with it and then just cutting the excess off i know that some still will probably roll under but at least it's will be minimal now for this little piece, it has these top holes, it has the light underneath it. So then I'm like, okay, how am I going to do this? So I'm trying to roll a piece of that contact paper in where the holes is. I'm going to be spraying this piece, so I want to prevent the spray paint from going in the inside. So no, this probably wasn't the easiest of task. And I thrifted it and I thought it was a nightlight. And then I had a viewer say that it's supposed to have a top. It's supposed to be a wax warmer. I thought that was weird as a metal piece, but that's okay because I, my vision for it is a nightlight. It's a thrifted item and yep, it's in the Ginger Chick Rehab hands. And so I'm making it into a nightlight. But at first I don't want to be able to, I don't want to paint the inside of it because that is what's going to help that little light shine. And then I'm doing the same thing. I got some Dollar Tree masking tape, these cute little tins, had these little piggies and the little chicken. And so what I'm doing is I'm just trying to eyeball what I feel is straight. And then I will cut this the tape off to a nice little square package so I can save that little piggy. They're actually little stencils that are pieces of vinyl that are on. I'm not gonna try to remove them because we all know vinyl stretches and they'll never go back on, but I love that little detail of them. So now these pieces are going to all get a undercoat of Rust-Oleum Paint and Primer 1 in the flat black. I like to distress my pieces. So their first coating is all going to get that nice smooth coating of this Rust-Oleum flat black on. 
If you notice, yep, I did tape off that little cow's tail. It is a Judy type of material that I did not want to spray paint black. And so, yep, like I said, all these little pieces are getting a coat of this Rust-Oleum. And if I can suggest anything, we are blessed to have a spray room. But if you can, if you're a thrifter, a DIYer, or just doing this for yourself at home, oh my goodness, find yourself a turntable. This turntable was probably for a TV, but I did not care. Look how easy it makes it for me to be able to spray these items in a 360. I absolutely cannot recommend it enough. And as you see, we just use extra pieces of board so I can bring one in and take one out. It does not really matter how you tackle these pieces when you're spraying it. For me, I just like to figure out which way am I going to get the most coverage on my first spray on them. So, yep, this is just what works for me. You all figure out what works for you. And yes, spray painting little cubbies makes it so much easier because painting with a brush is not very much fun when it comes to little cubbies. So before flipping these items over and getting the rest of the surface area that I can, I like to protect that Rust-Oleum paint with some polycrylic. I notice that sometimes if I do not do this, that that paint that will mar up, it doesn't have that protecting coated on it yet. So I go ahead with whatever I have gotten covered in the black and get that sprayed with some polycrylic to protect that paint. Since I'm not really coating these to cover, I am just getting this polycrylic. It comes out differently than the black spray paint, and so I'm just getting it on the basic surface area. I do not have to cover every pieces and parts like I do when I'm covering up the black. So I did not feel the need to take these into the spray room and use the 360 of a turntable. Like I said, I just need to get it on. So I actually thrifted a whole bunch of hockey pucks. When it comes to doing a round object and having to sit it on its side, not always the easiest thing because it wants to roll. And I had seen some professional woodworkers have these fancy discs from Rockler that I thought, you know what? I bet you if I ever came across hockey pucks in the thrift store, I could use those. So, yep, if you see any out there, there's another little handy tool to stop things from rolling. So now that that polycrylic is dry, now I can flip them over and try to get the rest of the surface area that I can. Like I said, I like to get that first coverage, the most coverage I can, so when I flip these over, I don't have much left to spray paint. And the same thing, that's just a little bit of spray paint I'm doing, so I don't feel to, the need to carry every single board in again to the spray room. So now I have a couple pieces. I, If you watch my channel, you know that I like my backs just to be just as pretty as my fronts. So, so for some of these pieces, I want to keep that crisp black or try to keep the crisp black anyway. So for this metal cross, I'm just going to be doing that same thing that I did with that clock. I'm just going to be setting a piece of this contact paper in hopes that it will stay stuck and not have all that white paint leaking through. So for these items, I'm going to be using this Waverly chalk paint that I get at Walmart. I have been liking it for the smaller metal resin type of items. The reason that I have is I like water distressing it because sometimes when these type of pieces and I am sanding them with sandpaper, it goes too far down into the item occasionally. Not like when I want to do a wood item when I want to see some of that wood. So that's why I've kind of, I like this 
I like this technique of using the Waverly chalk paint so when I go to water distress it, I'm just getting to the black because these are not pieces that I want to see that original color in. And I could kind of tell the way that this paint was glooping right out of the bottle that I needed to start right off with watering it down, getting it to a nice regular paint consistency. So yep, I'm just using some water and just getting it to where I think it's a workable paint. And then this, the brush that I'm using is in that craft section at Walmart. It is white bristles and it's really soft. So it makes a nice smooth paint job. So when I'm applying this paint, it's going on nice and smooth. And if you notice, yep, I do have a little Lazy Susan turntable also that was thrifted. That way when I'm working on my small items, I can do that 360 of turn. The, just anything for us filling two booths now, I need a lot of items. So I need to get the masses done and time is very important to me. And this is the most efficient way I feel that I can get these pieces done. Now, nothing says that you have to paint the entire piece white just because I spray painted it back black. This piece has so much detail. This is just a decorative pretty piece. I don't feel the need to completely cover it in white. So I am just taking a little bitty brush and I am just getting the areas that I can envision being white. Do you ever wonder what's going through one's head when they are painting? And as I'm painting on this, all I could envision is Bob Ross saying happy little trees. And then this is another piece. I just envisioned these flowers. It's supposed to be a candle holder, but for me, it is flowers. It is a beautiful decor piece. And just the top side of those leaves being painted white. So yep, I have to take the time. I've got to go in with the smaller brush, but that's okay. I enjoy painting. I find it very relaxing. And like I said, all I can envision is Bob Ross saying happy little trees. So when you guys are all doing all your painting and your crafting, what do you do? Do you listen to music? Do you put on your favorite YouTuber, hopefully? Or do you watch a movie, something on Netflix or Disney? I just, yep, this is, to me is a happy little place. I enjoy the whole painting. I find it very surreal. And just watching a little TV episode or one of my favorite YouTubers and then just getting these items all prettied up. For these little tins, I am doing my version of the Ginger Chick Rehab version of Enamelware, where I just leave that little seam out. I paint around the little handles and leave that black. And nope, I do not like the mass produced, the original Enamelware that has the inside of it white. Nope, I just leave my mind black. This is just what works for me. It's the vision that I feel for these pieces. It just has that enamelware look. Then for this cross, this has all those little holes in it. It's hard metal. Yep, I could go in with that little bitty brush, but man, that would take a while. And it's not quite the detail that I need to cover up and not get. And as you know, this cross has a beautiful flower in the middle. So I'm just going and getting the most paint on using one of these type of brushes. I don't know if it's a chalk paint brush. I don't know. I All I know is it is a different type of brush that was in that section that I thought, oh, I could probably use that on things. So I purchased that along with the other brushes. So as I'm going in and painting on this piece, the flower petals just kind of grabbed the paint and it was just ever so slightly. And then I'm like, oh, I like that. I'm going to leave that the way it is. So then I went in with a little detail brush and finished off a couple more little pieces just to feather it out. Sometimes God wink moments. It looked pretty the way it is. So you just stop. 
So now I'm just removing that piece of contact paper I laid on the top so that it didn't, when I sprayed it, go in. And then I did kind of fill it with a little bit more contact paper. And then I'm showing you that I switched out to masking tape to cover up those holes. But now I'm on to painting this, what I call it a night light, and doing a little bit of detail with a detail brush around the handles. So when it came to painting this little caddy, I, my vision was to paint the entire base of it, not inside, but the outer shell of it white. But when it came to those bottom legs, they were welted together and I just didn't feel like I would be able to make a crisp, clean line. And then I noticed that the front piece of this was a solid piece of metal itself. So then I just eyeballed that as my stopping point. Sometimes the piece tells you what the piece is going to do. Here's where I'm talking about. That is a solid weld. Well, and you want it to be because you want it to stay together. So here's what everybody looks like with their first coat of white. As you can tell, it is just on, even though I kind of think that bunny looks kind of cute with just one coat, it is just what it is. It's all just on the first coat. So now I'm on to painting my second coat. I'm kind of trying out this brush because I had to water that first coat of paint down. I don't really feel like this is a second bottle. This is the, I've only used one other bottle of this. I feel like the second bottle's not quite as nice as the first Waverly bottle is. You know, I'm used to the consistency of my Kills paint that I've always used. So I'm trying to get a little bit more paint on with this next coverage, but I'm still having to water it down because it just went on really chalky. For the metal pieces, I do feel like it is covering them a lot better than the resin pieces. I don't know why. That's why I'm still on the fence about this chalk paint. So I, I like consistency. That's probably the OCD in me, but it is working out really well right now for the metal. And I know when I'm going in with this little bitty detail brush around these handles that I'm going to have to go in three times just the way that it moves the paint. You just can't get enough coverage and I don't want to have any runs, especially since I've added water to this. Especially your second coat, you really want to have it a little bit more watered down so you can get that smooth texture. Not that there's a big difference between the first and second coat on this piece. I just had to share how pretty this flower looked. And yep, going back in for a third coat around these little handles. And actually, I have to say, because I had to water that first coat down, and then the second was watered down, that I ended up, a lot of the pieces, I ended up having to do three coats on. So now I'm going in with some water and a piece of drop cloth, meaning that it's a little bit heavier of a material, a little bit rougher of a material, and I'm soaking that in with a little bit, not drenching, soaking it a little bit in with the water, and now I'm going back in and rubbing those areas that I want to see that detailing through, and especially on this piece where it has that beautiful little 
detailing of that wreath and that home sweet home. Oh, it's just so pretty. And this is where that spraying of that black underneath and then spraying that polycrylic kind of comes in handy because now that I'm rubbing on it, if I would not have put that sealer in between the black and the white, a lot of times when you're doing this, you could have like a little bit gray mess. So that's where, for me, a key step is sealing that in with that polycrylic before I put this white paint on. I could tell you that all these just all water distress so easily, but I would be fibbing because, oh my gosh, I don't know if it was having to put three coats on or just the difference between one bottle to the next bottle. The elbow grease that I had to use to get some of these items to distress, I ended up getting a gently, very used piece of a sandpaper to sand some of this white paint off to get the distressing I was looking for. I was a little bit on the disappointed that I wasn't going to be able to achieve with water distressing like I had done on the last bottle. It just distressed so easily for me that first time. But, you know, it is what it is, and I just I didn't want to go in with a strong piece of sandpaper. This is just some from the dollar store because, you know, that's not really as strong as it it should be. So, um, yep, I had to go in with sandpaper very gingerly because I didn't want it to get down to the original color. Remember, this metal piece, the original color was red. Then I take the little bit of the sandpaper, run it, rub it a little bit gingerly, get a little bit of that paint off, and then go back in with my drop cloth that was soaked in water to remove some more of the paint. It took a lot longer than I wanted it to. Yep, that's what I ended up having to do to most all these pieces is go in with this Dollar Tree sandpaper. Just go really lightly so it did not go all the way through the black. Like I said, I like when I'm doing wooden pieces, I like some of that natural wood to show through. But on my metal pieces, I do not. I just like just the black to show through. So I'm just rubbing very gently, getting it, and then I'll go back in and water distress it. Make sure that I have a nice, smooth paint job. So what I ended up finding out is if I soaked it just a little bit, the paint just a little bit with water and then went back in with the sandpaper very, 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 very lightly, I could get a little bit of that paint to remove and then go back in with the drop cloth. That's what I'm saying. It was a little bit different procedure than the first time I had tried this. And as carefully as I tried, you can see where I touched white paint on this item. It is okay because I will tell you that this Waverly in ink matches up perfectly to that Rust-Oleum spray paint. So wherever I may have touched, I need to fix. Yep, I just went back in with a detail brush and fixed it with that ink chalk paint. And then for this piece, since it was already a wooden piece, just the way that it was made and built and how all the crevices and pieces and parts I sprayed it just that was the ease of it but I did not mind going in with it just using the sandpaper on this piece because I didn't mind the little bit of the wood showing through. And then making sure that I had the smoothest of paint jobs just went back in with that wet piece of drop cloth and distressed it some more, just getting all that dusting off from sanding it along with smoothing out that paint. Though I don't know how much you all wanna see me sanding, I needed to throw this in because I thought I had a viewer that was interested in one of these boxes like this that they had. And so that's all I'm doing with this piece. It is a wooden box. So I'm just going in and let the sandpaper distress where the sandpaper will hit on those little brad, those little buttons that are on this piece and then just taking the rag and smoothing that so it's a nice smooth paint job. And then now on all the pieces I am going in with this very thin finishing wax. Yes I know Waverly has a wax. I used it the first time. It 
removed my paint, was not happy. So I quickly, after one item, realized to go back into my Verithane wax that we use all the time. So I have no problems after I've distressed these pieces using this Verithane wax and it does not remove any of my paint, at least my distressing, where I had put my distressing. Are you curious, can I use the natural wax on the bottom of this? Yes, I want to keep this black. I'm not antiquing the, the bottom of this piece. I'm just going in with that Verithane wax. And since I sealed it with polycrylic, it just makes it a nice, smooth finish. I know you all probably just want to get to the reveal, but let's see how this contact paper did on this clock. How much am I going to have to clean up afterwards? I have to say I really had minimal to clean up. I could just remove it with a little bit of water and this little, yep, it is a Pamper Chef scraper that, yeah, but it works just fine. Remember this, the front of this piece is plastic, so I could not use a metal scraper on this but yep a little bit of that scraping a little bit of a clorox wipe and i'm getting whatever little crevices um filled in with some of that paint but the contact paper worked rather well i have to say when it came to painting these candlesticks they had that felt bottom and for some reason they're always falling off but you can see the ugly bottom on these that i had to save that so i'm just using a little bit of my starbond glue to adhere them back to the, they are metal the bottoms are metal so i'm just using some of that glue to reattach it yes i could have used hot glue but it, sometimes i think the hot glue is a little bit on the thick side and now the fun of it removing all that everything that i taped off including this cord yep it was kind of a messy little contact paper and some masking tape but well worth keeping the cord as nice as the cord was before i have a viewer write in my comments that i left a tag on that bottom that is the directions for the light bulb so since those are directions i did not tape over that you need to know what light bulb you need to replace that with so for these two pieces, you can almost tell that I wasn't going to be able to get of any of that Verithane wax on these very well. So I'm just taking them back into the spray room and I'm giving them a nice misting of this polycrylic spray to seal that chalk paint in. Let's see if our piggies and our little rooster is still underneath this tape. And did I do an okay job? using an exacto knife to make a nice square line i have to say i don't think i did too bad but that definitely left a raised edge so i was going in trying to water distress it but i'm like yeah i'm just gonna get the sandpaper i wet it a little bit and then going in and i want that not to be quite the bump out that i can feel so i'm just taking that sandpaper where i just wetted the chalk paint and then just making some distressed marks where I visually like them. For the back of this envelope, I sanded it just a little bit. I know I could not remove that glue all the way at the bottom. I could have, but it's going to be tucked away anyway. And then I am actually sealing this in with the Verithane wax. I should have showed you my rag because all that stain had, was coming off of it. But now I'm just replacing this back together. That's why I said it's a little bit easier if you separate the two pieces. That way you get that nice crisp paint line. I have a few of items like this little caddy tote that I'm going to be putting a stencil on and I want to make sure that that paint is on there good when I go to remove my stencil I'm not taking all that paint off so I'm making sure that I seal that in even though I waxed it waxing the stencils do not like to stick to waxing so I want to seal this back in with some polycrylic then when I removed that tape off that little cow's tail, I just did not like that material. I didn't think that color did anything for the white color that I had just painted him in distress. So I just took a little bit of that ink and a little bit of water and just made my own little hair dye for his tail. So here are the four pieces that I'm going to be doing a little bit something more on. I brought them into the house off from the workshop. 
I, there's just not enough room. I know I laugh when everybody's like, show me your craft space. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'd have to show you my attic, my extra room, my other extra room, my workshop. Do you, I, when you're, you do this for a living, it's your whole house. So I went into my stash. I looked to see what flowers, what florals, what I had that I thought were pleasing to this envelope, especially with that wood behind it. I absolutely loved that stain. So I just have um, some of this leftover lamb's ear that I'd gotten last year at Walmart. And I have these little flowers, these little pit berries that I have thrifted a lot of and I'm trying to find a use for them because I've stuck them in jars and stuff and nobody ever wants them in my booth. I love them. I decorate with them. So anyway, I'm going right into using the Dollar Tree foam and I know that I removed all the foam to paint this and all the flowers that were already out of this. It was glued in there. So Yep, the Dollar Tree foam, the floor foam, you just cut it up and stick it in. And for me, my next step, I like to take some of this grass, and you can buy this also at the dollar store, but I just was lucky enough to thrift it quite a few times in this thrift store. You just want something to cover up that foam, even though I like to do my florals as full as possible, just in case you see that, which is not a terrible green, but you don't want to see your floral foam from underneath. So I know that probably everybody has a different way of putting florals into their arrangements. And if I can suggest anything, when get yourself a good pair of wire nippers. So I always start in my center and then work my way down. So I keep my center piece a little bit longer and then I do a little bit shorter on either side. And I kind of work back and forth on the heights, removing some of the leaves. It's okay because I save every piece and hot glue them in so I have a nice full arrangement. And now I'm going in with another layer, all those little pieces that I had snipped off. Yes, uh, no clipping left behind. So I'm getting those tucked in, even though I don't glue that floral foam in, these will attach to that greenery grass. And then I will tell you, just because I visioned it does not mean it worked out. Oh my goodness, these were not wired enough. They were too loose. They wouldn't push into the floral foam. They look like, they, uh, I did not end up using these cute little sprigs, but maybe for another project. So back to my floral stash I go. And I have a couple little sprigs that I had cut off from that new lavender they got this year at Walmart. And then these are a couple pieces left over from last year, so still pretty cost efficient. Those lamb's ears, I think it was the two pieces for the $2 last year. And I think I still got this lavender, maybe $1.47 for a bunch. And like I said, I had those, two, those longer pieces left over from that $3 piece. Yeah, when it comes to floral arrangements, it's not the cheapest thing in my booth by any means. I'll sell this arrangement probably around $30, but and then it is what it is. It's a beautiful arrangement, and you have to get what you put into it. And so I do the same thing that I did with that lamb's ear. So I'm visually remembering where I put that tall piece of lamb's ear, and so these are my two tallest piece of this lavender so what i'm doing is i'm putting one on either side you want to make even though it's a small little package you still want to have it even even on each side it's kind of like you put one in here you put one over there you put one here you put one over there and when it comes to flooring arrangement you just do what is pleasing to your eye and you will know when it's done when you are happy with it then you know it's done for me i like really full arrangements and some of these pieces and parts i had to cut some extra off because it, there's it's not really 
like going to be a tall arrangement it's more of a full arrangement so now that i've got that shorter lavender in there i'm taking those few sprigs that i had of that taller lavender and i'm visually figuring out in my head where each piece needs to go and yes i'm going to be saving all those clippings on that bottom that i've used but yep kind of randomly sticking them in there but still with a pattern I have to say I'm actually glad that I had some of the, that longer sprig, some of that bottom piece of lavender that I got to cut because I wasn't completely happy with the way that these lamb's ears were just going straight up. So that was a nice little God wink moment that this other broke down that texture and just made it flow a little bit better for me. So I don't know about you all, but I know that I am obsessed with those crockery stamps. So I was on the search for some more when I ordered these from Etsy, which I really thought were some different type of crockery stamps. I guess I did not read fully or I'm not really sure. So here comes some transfers. I really wanted them to be stamps, but that's okay. Apparently it was meant to be. It is what it is. So now I have to kind of figure out what I want on the front of this little um, envelope. And so I, I do like these. I'm not really familiar with transfers. So that's one thing about when I make my own stencils, I like everything to be original. I don't wanna mass produce a whole bunch of the same items all the time. I have a lot of repeat customers. So I like to give them something a little bit different each time so i guess this was perfect that these came as a transfer so i picked out which one i wanted i wanted something really simple because it's a beautiful floral arrangement i want you to have that little bit of detail but i don't want it to take away from the floral arrangement itself so i just picked out some wording and I really don't even have any idea what this says, but I guess that's okay. But so, yep, I just wanted those simple wordings. I like that it was slightly round. It actually fits in perfectly. So I'm just using a little bit of this Dollar Tree masking tape to hold this in place because the only thing I know about a transfer, the direction said that I'm going to have to use this little piece of plastic, this little device that they sent with it to rub it on. I'm going to tell you, nope, I've never used a transfer, but I, I guess it's pretty, you know, I could tell that that letter was adhered. I could tell that it was off that top piece of plastic and it was on there. So I, now I know what color I'm looking for. And yeah, I, I mean, I really had to rub to get it to adhere, but that's probably, you want it the longevity there. So I guess it was worth the time. Nope. It was, I probably took me a few minutes to get this to adhere to this, envelope but well worth it i really like the finished product so i knew i had cut the roping off that hung this piece that i needed some new roping i don't know what it is about that thicker roping it just reminds me more of a nautical rope than a farmhouse rope but I needed a substantial piece. This little jute was not going to work. So, yep, this is what I'm doing. I taped three pieces of jute down and I'm making a simple braid to act as the hanging system for this envelope. Then I find if I put a little bit of hot glue in where the knot is and then kind of hold it and let it kind to glue in place that I don't have to worry about it coming unraveled. So for that two-tier little caddy, that little cubby box, I kind of envision people storing their seeds, some flowers, whether it be fake or real. I just thought it was a unique piece. So that's how I wanted to word it. I actually had quite a few view viewers that had the same um, vision I did in my comments. So I loved hearing that. So I'm taking this design. This is my silhouette. I don't know I kind of go for my silhouette more. I still can't figure out how to take the images apart on my Cricut. No matter how hard I try, you all give me hints. I go and I just look at that screen and I can't find how to do it. So that's why I'm back at my silhouette. So this is a design off the design store. I liked the curviness of the fresh flowers. I liked that 
mark it and I'm just using those pieces and parts. So I ungrouped it, grouped back in the wording that I wanted. I want that mark it to be at the top. So I'm doing, that's where I'm moving everything around. I'm a visual type of person. I have to regroup that together and then put that. But I kind of thought that I liked the blooms and stems, but then I didn't end up using it and just deleted that. And then back to the store I went looking to see what other little ideas I could get. Then I liked this seeds at the bottom, I definitely knew that I wanted to do something like that. So deleted the bloom and stems, deleted what I don't want, the flowers. I just wanted that wording. I, I will tell you when it comes to making individual stencils, this was an hour, if not more, just to create this stencil. But for me, having an original piece is well worth it. Once I moved that seeds and stems and blooms closer to the fresh flower and tried to enlarge it, it didn't really flow. There wasn't, even though I like all that different fonts together, I didn't like it. So then I retyped it out in something else and then deleted that. It, and like I always say, just do something until you love it. And if you love it, others will love it too. And then the sweet tea font that I picked is in a cursive font, so I need to weld it all together so that it doesn't make those individual letters cut into each other so it all flows. And after searching for something to put on that little watering can, I picked this out though. I didn't think I needed a picture of a watering can because you already know it's a watering can and you can put your own flowers in it if you want. It's just personal preference. I just liked that floral market. Here's something I don't ever remember enough is when I'm cutting out on the stencil on a white ob object to cut it out in black and when I'm doing a black object to cut it out in white, one in a million times I actually remember to do it on this one. So I like to use the Oracle vinyl, the permanent, the 651 that I get off Amazon. And when it comes to cutting off my stencils, I like to cut them as close as I possibly can. It just helps me when I'm eyeballing and when I'm trying to center my stencil on an object. If I have too much of the vinyl, it just throws me off on where I need to measure. So just a, another personal preference. If you're better at it than I am, this is just what works for me. I don't mind adding a little bit of masking tape around the image I buy it at the dollar store anyway. I just rather have it be as centered as I want it to be. And then I just use that Duck brand contact paper. I put it on our couch to get it a little bit dirty. Maybe some cat hair. You know, I got three cats. And um, that helps it not be so uber sticky. So then, yes. Um, and then just re-rub it on and then remove that contact paper and watch it all, all for those little pieces and parts. And then now I have um, all three of my vinyls placed. I have them centered where I want them to be. I can move on to, yep, I will be wrapping some masking tape around these just so I don't accidentally get paint on where I don't want paint to be. And I like to use the multi-surface paint, the Apple Barrel paint. I You can get it off Amazon. You can get it at Walmart. This is just, I'm a fan of this multi-surface, multi-use paint. I just use a makeup sponge applicator that I get at the Dollar Tree, come a you know, dollar for a whole bunch of them. And so when it comes to putting the paint color on, a little is best, I find. I don't want, even though I've rubbed that vinyl on there and I think that I've got it pretty secure, I rather have just a little bit of paint on that makeup sponge and then go over it a couple times to achieve the darkness of the color that I'm looking for. And I didn't show you how I cut uh, the little word market to fit in this little bitty space on this little file. I'm going over it with coat number two. Like I said, you just, whatever you're eyeballing, how darkness you want it to be. I want this to be a crisp black. I will use the heat of a blow dryer to help dry in between coats. 
Also to reactivate the sticky on the tape and on that vinyl so I don't accidentally pull any of that all that time I pe spent painting this piece. It is well worth the time. This is one step I hope I never forget because too many times have I pulled off paint and had to repair things. Now to go back in and remove all those little pieces that are left behind, I like to use a boutonniere pin. I get a pack of them off of Amazon. And when you're doing this, you kind of just want to have it gliding in the air a little bit, just hovering above. You just want to grab the pieces of vinyl. You're not digging a hole. You don't want to mar up underneath there. Now you've just watched me do a transfer on a stencil, so I'll just do a little quick version. That's why I didn't show you that little market on that file. How much can you watch me stencil? <laughs> anyway, so this is just same thing, that contact paper. And the one little tip I wanted to show you here is that round object. I saw this on TikTok. They were doing some of those cups that they're doing epoxy on, and they used two uh, lint rollers. And yeah, I'll tell you, yep, it sticks to the mat, it sticks to the object, and then it does not roll. So this is really why I'm showing the, you this part, other than I'm going to be painting this one with white multi-use paint. That's really what I wanted to share, that little tip of, yeah, you can buy two lint rollers at the dollar store to seal my stencils in I want these to stay that nice black I want to make sure that they're not getting rubbed off I'm just going to take them outside and give them a light coat of this clear acrylic spray now the acrylic spray it is smelly so please do it outside in a ventilated area So I thank you so much for watching today's video and tell me which one was your favorite flip. And as always, thank you for being part of my YouTube family. And if you're new to my channel and visiting it for the first time and you enjoyed this kind of content, just hit the subscription button along with the notification bell so you know when I've uploaded a new video.